And of the regions that we're going to be looking at today, one could make the case is probably the most evolved of the regional missile defense architectures that are emerging around the world. It features, as Jim Miller pointed out, NATO's active layered theater ballistic missile defense command and control apparatus that had an initial operating capacity reached last year. A centerpiece, of course, is the, the United States uh, um, European phase adaptive approach, which had its first phase uh, go into operation in 2011, uh, the next phase being 2015 and then 2018 and 2020. And then, of course, there are a series of NATO allies that had their own missile, national missile defense programs. The Germans have a missile defense program, the Dutch, they and the United States have deployed their patriots to, to, uh, to Turkey. The French are developing their own missile defense systems. There's MIADs. And then, of course, I might add, since we have a, a Polish guest here, Poland is entering the club with uh, its announced plans over the that announced within the last six months to spend five to ten billion dollars its own air and missile defense capability. Air and missile defense, missile defense has a strong foundation in, 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 in Europe in the transatlantic community. First and foremost, it benefits from the institutions and culture and practice of intense military collaboration, largely provided through NATO and its time-tested and battle-tested uh, international military command structure. Missile defense is expensive. These are not uh, off-the-shelf, so to speak, uh, quick systems you just buy. They're expensive. They're expensive to operate. They're complex to operate. And Europe, the United States, North America has national defense structures that have, despite the economic challenging times, relatively robust economic uh, infrastructure and capabilities. They're mature military establishments. But missile defense, transatlantic missile defense, isn't without its challenges. As I said, it is costly. And some of the, the in, in the era of defense austerity, that's going to crimp plans. It's a complex, regional missile defense is a complex undertaking. There's still, I think, significant command and control decisions and doctrinal decisions that have to be made over how these systems will be applied. And then, of course, there is threat perceptions. And while you can say that in Europe there is a, in, in North, with North America, there is a fairly commonly adopted set of priorities based on a common set of threat perceptions, there are still nuances of debate within the alliance. Different countries provide different prioritization to the threats posed by potential <coughs> Russian capabilities, potential Iranian ca capabilities, and the emergence of uh, other capabilities, tr ballistic missile defense capabilities around <coughs> the world. To address the drivers and future of transatlantic missile defense, we have a great panel here. We have uh, Frank Rose, who's the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Space and Defense Policy. In this capacity, he advises the Secretary of State and other senior officials in the U.S. government on issues related to arms control and defense policy, including missile defense, space policy, conventional arms control, and such. Uh, he brings to the, to the table also many years on the Hill, where he served on the House Armed Services Committee as a professional staff member, the, uh, the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. He even spent wisely a good investment of time working in Senator Kerry's office a number of years back. I think that's paying off today. Uh, and I got to meet him. Uh, when I was working in the Pentagon and he was in forces policy and we actually traveled to Europe in 2002 to roll out the, the then administration's uh, approach to transatlantic missile defense. Uh, Dr. Marcin Zabrowski is the director of the Polish Institute of International Affairs in Warsaw. Some would argue that's the premier uh, national security think tank in, 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 uh, cent in Central Europe. He advises the foreign minister and the prime minister and other senior officials on matters of national security, foreign policy and defense. Uh, I would add that he has significantly transformed PISM, his institution, which used to have a kind of, you could say, a central European foreign policy perspective into an institution that now has, has thinking and operations that span the globe and span the full spectrum of national security, not just defense policy, but cyber policy and, and such. He's built that organization. He serves as the director of the transatlantic program at the European Union Institute for Security Studies in Paris. And his roots actually are in the Ministry of Economy in Poland. So he's seeing it uh, from also a very pragmatic perspective. And of course, we have Walt Slocum with us, a senior counsel, Kaplan and Drysdale. Most importantly, he is a board member of the Atlantic Council. Uh, he brings to the table his experience as the Undersecretary of Defense for Policy during, during the Clinton administration. 
He continues his active role influencing uh, U.S. government circles as a member of the Defense Policy Board. He served on the Silberman Rob Commission uh, that addressed the WMD. Uh, and he most recently uh, was a member of the National Research Council's Task Force on Missile Defense, whose report, Making Sense of Missile making sense of ballistic missile defense was released last fall. I've asked our, our, our three speakers here to provide some brief opening remarks. Uh, we'll start off with Frank, then Marson, and Walt, uh, and then we'll have a, uh, hopefully a robust discussion. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Ian. It's a real pleasure to be here today. Uh, I was just uh, you know, thinking, sitting next to Ian and Walt, uh, I worked missile defense for Walt uh, when he was undersecretary. Shows you how long I've been working uh, missile defense issues uh, and with uh, Ian in the Bush administration. It's just amazing to me how far we have come on missile defense in the past 14 or 15 years with regards to NATO allies. Uh, back when I was working this issue with Walt, we were talking about uh, missile defense as destabilizing and decoupling to the, Amer the U.S. Uh, transatlantic alliance. Um, and then things have begun to change. Now, as we talk today, missile defense is a key strategic capability that the alliance is developing to deal with the threats uh, we face in the 21st century. You know, as Jim Miller noted in his remarks, in 2009, the United States conducted a comprehensive review of our ballistic missile defense plans and programs, which later culminated in the Ballistic Missile Defense Review, or BMDR. Uh, that report sets out some very important policy priorities that continue to guide our missile defense policy and operations today. First, as Jim noted in his uh, speech, the United States will continue to defend the homeland against limited ballistic missile, missile attack and keep ahead of the threat. And second, the United States will defend against regional missile threats to U.S. forces while protecting allies and enabling them to defend themselves. The United States has no more important security relationship than we do with our NATO allies, and that relationship continues to grow. We work closely with our NATO allies on many of the most important international security issues we face, from Afghanistan to Libya. In order to ensure our European NATO allies were protected, the United States decided in September 2009 to deploy missile defense assets to Europe to defend against the threat of ballistic missile attacks from the Middle East. This led to the development of the European Phase Adaptive Approach, or EPAA, as the United States' contribution to NATO ballistic missile defense. The deployments of the EPAA are tailored in phases to address the growing threat of ballistic missiles. If the threat increases, so too would defensive capabilities, allowing NATO to stay well ahead against the ballistic missile threat. The system is also adaptive, so, we, so it can be modified to address changes in the threat and technology. Since President Obama's announcement of the EPAA in 2009, we have come a long way towards implementing the strategy. The United States has deployed a radar in Turkey and implemented the continuous rotation of Aegis BMD-capable ships in the Mediterranean to provide for protection of Southern Europe. We have also completed and ratified basic agreements to establish missile defense sites in Romania in, 20, in the 2015 time frame and in Poland in the 2018 time frame as part of phases two and three of the EPAA. And I had the honor to be uh, the lead negotiator for all of those agreements. Uh, NATO also made considerable strides in developing a missile defense capability. At the Lisbon summit in November 2010, allies shifted their focus from a missile defense capability that was solely focused on protecting deployed forces in a regional context to a policy of providing missile defense protection for all NATO European populations, territory, and forces. At the same meeting, NATO welcomed the U.S. phase adaptive approach as a national contribution to the NATO system. Then, at the Chicago summit in May 2012, NATO announced that it had achieved an interim missile defense capability which provides NATO with a basic command and control for its missile defense architecture. 
As part of this interim capability, the United States placed the radar uh, in Turkey uh, under NATO command and control. This is a significant first step into realizing NATO's commitment to achieving full operational capability of its missile defense system. NATO allies have also made important contributions to this effort. Our NATO allies will contribute more than a billion dollars in NATO common funding uh, to the ALT-BMD, or Active Layered Theater Ballistic Missile Defense Command and Control System. Turkey, Romania, Poland, Spain, and Germany have all agreed to host elements of the NATO missile defense system on their territory. The Netherlands has indicated that it will spend close to 250 million euros to modify the radars on its frigates to detect and track ballistic missiles at long ranges and contribute its Patriot missiles to NATO missile defense. Germany is also exploring, uh, is also exploring developing an airborne infrared sensor. France has proposed a concept for, shared, for a shared early warning satellite. These commitments are critical contributions to NATO's developing missile defense system. The need for this capability to defend our deployed forces and our European allies remains just as important today as when we started this work in 2009. Since the announcement of the EPAA, the regional ballistic missile threat to Europe has continued to grow. The number of states that possess ballistic missile capabilities is growing and those with those capabilities are increasing their inventories. Many states are moving to more advanced solid propellant ballistic missiles or advanced liquid propellant systems. The range and accuracy of ballistic missiles is also increasing, putting even more targets at risk. More and more, we are seeing ballistic missiles used in conflicts today. Both the Gaddafi regime and the Assad regime resorted to the use of ballistic missiles against the opposition in their countries. In response to the concerning situation in Syria, U.S., German, and Dutch Patriot systems are currently deployed in Turkey under NATO command and control to protect against potential threats from Syrian ballistic missiles. In addition, Iran already has the largest ballistic missile force of any Middle Eastern country and possesses a wide range of short and medium range ballistic missiles that continue to grow in quantity and sophistication. In Asia, North Korea continues to build longer range missile systems, successfully putting a satellite into orbit using the Tapo Dong 2 system, and most alarmingly, announced that it had conducted a third nuclear weapons test. As these threats continue to grow, the United States remains committed to developing new technologies that will allow the United States to stay ahead of the threat and ensure the continued defense of our homeland, our deployed forces, and our friends and allies around the world. Finally, let me briefly conclude with some points on the issue of missile defense in Russia. The United States continues to seek cooperation with Russia on missile defense, both bilaterally and through NATO. As we have explained to Russia on numerous occasions, the EPAA is designed to address the threat from the, mid from the Middle East and has no capability to undermine Russia's strategic deterrent. At the Chicago summit, NATO allies made it very clear, um, a clear, a very clear statement of our intent with regards to Russia. The NATO uh, summit declaration stated, and I quote, the NATO missile defense system in Europe will not undermine strategic stability. NATO missile defense is not directed against Russia and will not undermine Russia's strategic deterrence capabilities, end quote. We have provided Russia with a number of ideas and approaches for transparency, and we remain committed to discussing other approaches to building confidence between our two countries. However, we have also made clear publicly and privately the United States cannot accept limitations on its missile defense capabilities. We will continue to work with Russia to find a way forward to develop meaningful missile defense transparency and cooperation that could be mutually beneficial to both countries. Uh, let me stop there and I'd be happy to take questions later. Thank you.
Well, thank you, Ian, for your kind words. And uh, it, it is naturally a great pleasure to be here. Um, great pleasure to talk at a conference on a missile defense organized by the Atlantic Council, uh, which is uh, one of our closest partners in the region. Uh, and we have, uh, as you can imagine, the, the whole issue of uh, missile defense is really hotly debated in Poland. I mean, you, we already heard some of that here uh, during the first panel. Uh, it, it is even a hotter debate in, in Poland, as you can imagine. And recently we, we hosted both Vienna and Bari at the events in my institute, which were committed to uh, missile defense. And um, we also held an event organized and sponsored by, the, by Raytheon. So I'm delighted to have Doug here uh, with us uh, today. Um, and we, we are also delighted to work with the Atlantic Council on our annual transatlantic event uh, called the Wrocław Global Forum, which is our signature event in, in Poland and the most important uh, annual event we, uh, we do and in which we are involved. Turning to the very issue of missile defense, I mean, I, I have to say that uh, w we do perceive the threat from missile defense technologies would be uh, something really alarming in, in, in the region. It's a... Uh, um, as James Miller said, it's not, it's not static, it's seen as uh, developing, it's seen as, uh, as real. Uh, and in particular, uh, we see a threat uh, related to the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. Um, the technologies are cheaper, uh, the technologies are more available, the way, main ways and means of developing, uh, of delivery are also more accessible. I happened to be on Tel Aviv on the day when uh, the first uh, missiles were reaching the town in many, many years, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and that felt absolutely surreal, being in this serene, uh, sunny town on a uh, very nice morning and hearing on the news that, that, that a possible missile uh, threat is, uh, is, uh, was current. Um, so this is not abstract, it is uh, just around the corner, really. We are also witnessing ballistic missiles um, uh, used uh, by the Syrian regime, uh, by the advances of the Iranian uh, missile program, uh, and there is a growing sophistication of the Hezbollah uh, arsenal. Uh, and other sources of threats in Europe can also appear anytime soon. So this is all uh, current and, and uh, you know, this is basically happening as we speak. Um, now, develop developments of missile defense systems appear to be really one of the <coughs> solutions of, of tackling these challenges. Um, and that provides defense not only to our populations, but also to our deployed uh, forces and to our installations in the, in the region and beyond. Uh, and it also serves as a tool of deterrence, and it can persuade potential adversaries from actually developing uh, the technologies, which uh, do cost uh, some money. Um, they already mentioned here deployment of the uh, of Patriot batteries uh, in Turkey uh, is really a, a good confirmation that uh, the ballistic um, missile threat is treated with uh, urgency by all NATO allies, regardless of their location. Uh, and that is also a matter of credibility and solidarity of the alliance. Um, values which are naturally of great importance for, for Poland also. It should be underlined here that the missile defense is seen in, in, in Poland as, a, as one of the elements of the larger deterrence and, 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 uh, uh, and defense posture of NATO. We still need uh, the nuclear component of NATO deterrence uh, as, uh, even as we are looking into the ways of reducing the salience of the numbers of nuclear uh, weapons worldwide. Uh, and crucial, we still need uh, state-of-the-art conventional uh, capabilities. Uh, our armed forces and NATO must be capable of acting jointly and effectively, making full use of a technological uh, advantage. Uh, and naturally, uh, they must be funded adequately. Uh, and finally, it's very important um, uh, issue in, in our region is, is to maintain political cohesion of NATO. Uh, and we must be able to agree on a joint assessment of threats and challenges. Now, let me turn to the European MD architecture very briefly. As you know, Poland agreed to uh, cooperate with the United States on the deployment of a missile uh, defense site in Regikova, a place I never heard of uh, before. 
uh, but it's now uh, all over Pol Polish uh, news. Uh, and that was under the plans which was drawn by the former president, George W. Bush administration. Uh, the original agreement was signed in 2008, and Poland was subjected then to uh, very sharp criticism in Europe, in particular for allegedly endangering European stability. Uh, we heard that from Russia, but we also heard that from many partners in NATO. Now this plan was canceled, then it was changed, and the change of the concept and the introduction of the European phase adaptive approach in 2009 uh, didn't change the attitude of, of the Russian administration. But it is important for us that NATO countries are now unified on the issue of missile defense. At the Lisbon summit in November 2010, all NATO members decided to build a territorial missile defense system. Uh, the system will comprise of commonly funded uh, command elements that can link sensors and interceptors uh, contributed voluntarily by individual NATO, NATO members. At the Chicago summit in May 2012, NATO announced achievements of interim missile defense capability that constitute the first step towards the effective system. Of course, the uh, EPAAA remains the key contribution to NATO's uh, system. Um, but our allies are on board too. Uh, European allies cover substantial portion of the costs um, of developing command and uh, control elements, estimated at about uh, over a billion euro. Some European allies have already um, and will assign very soon for the um, lower tier missile defense systems and uh, sensors. And as we just heard from uh, Frank, uh, APAA development is advancing. And Poland remains fully committed to cooperate with the United States on, uh, on the issue. Uh, we understand that 2018 timeframe uh, remains uh, valid. The SM3 installation in Regikovo will be uh, established and become fully operational by this date. That's, that's our understanding at this point. Um, these plans have been confirmed by the administration uh, and we are also counting on the Congress to maintain a sufficient level of, uh, of financing despite uh, all the budgetary challenges that we, are, that we uh, know about. Now, some claim that the phase from one to three of the EPAA uh, benefits first of all the Europeans. Uh, but it's very important to stress here that they provide protection to the US forces deployed in the region. Uh, and also to your bases and important installations, such as the early warning radars, uh, which can detect ballistic missiles attack against the US homeland. Now, placing SM3 inceptors in Poland, Romania, and at Aegis ships uh, will provide protection to all European members, uh, to all European members of NATO. And uh, from the Polish point of view, there's a clear advantage in, uh, in, in having the uh, political element of solidarity in that, uh, in that installation. Now, Poland follows the, uh, your debate on, on the political feasibility of uh, SM3 intercept of or so-called phase four very closely. Um, now, from our point of view, it is naturally for you to decide uh, whether that will be placed in Regikovo or whether that will be placed in, uh, in East Coast or West Coast, right? It will be placed in West Coast here. Um, this is really for the United States to, to decide. What is important from our point of view that is that the uh, decision concerning the final shape of phase four shouldn't weaken defense of Europe against increasing ballistic missile uh, threat. Uh, so the location is less important than that, that, uh, that fact. Now, regarding Russia, um, we should perhaps be uh, realistic about the possible uh, possibilities of turning missile defense into a subject of uh, cooperation and about treating MD as a game changer. Um, that's not very likely uh, to happen. Uh, however, we should think constructively about com possible confidence uh, building measures, uh, whether it's the political declaration uh, whether it's the information sharing and, and uh, whether it's monitoring and so on. 
Now, I've been just told that I need to uh, restrict my uh, remarks and finish very soon, so uh, just final word about um, our own um, plans for the lower tier um, missile defense development. Um, now, the development of national MD capabilities is a significant proof that Poland and other nations which are planning it, that are perceiving seriously the obligations from the, uh, that stem from the membership in NATO. Uh, it will be a basis for our national contribution to NATO MD effort, and I believe it is consistent with the US politicians and taxpayers' expectations for more active and more capable allies in Europe who can contribute to NATO MD uh, system. Uh, you have perhaps uh, heard some uh, details on the um, Polish debate. Just finally, I would like to say that uh, uh, we are debating currently the law on the financing of this project. Um, this share will be earmarked by the, um, for the AMD uh, purposes by a legislative act. Um, that was already uh, basis of which were already adopted by the parliament. The total sum available uh, is uh, estimated for about 30 billion Polish zloty, which is roughly around 10 billion uh, US dollars. And we can talk uh, more of the details of that in the, in the questions because I've been just told by Ian that I have to stop right now. Okay, thank you very much. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here, and thank you all for coming. Um, I also want to thank Raytheon, uh, not least because what I'm going to say is not entirely supportive of every aspect of the program, and it does demonstrate that they are interested in promoting a serious and open debate on this subject, as is the Atlantic Council. I also, uh, Frank Rose talks about how long he's been working on uh, ballistic missile defense. I started in this business when it was Safeguard and Sentinel. <laughs> um, much of what is relevant to this and to the European question has been said. The threat is serious and growing. I, I was interested particularly in Jim Miller's remark that a just in time is not the approach that one should take to this problem. Uh, while it is true that the threat takes a while to develop it is unfortunately very true that the defenses take a long time to develop and it is important not to be late yeah. to need if we are going to do this as I believe we should. Also I think we shouldn't focus entirely on Iran or more generally on North Korea. If you look at the region I think it would be optimistic to put it mildly to say that if we could somehow deal with the Iranian problem and the North Korean problem in the Asia Pacific, that would be the end of any concern ever about a threat from ballistic missiles. So that the problem is, should not be regarded simply as, well, let's look at the latest Iranian test and it'll tell us the answers. Um, as uh, both Jim and, and uh, Ian have said, I worked on the uh, National Academy of Sciences National Research Council study of ballistic missile defense. And the main thing I want to focus on is to explain some of our conclusions because uh, they do, uh, it is first of all, a very strong endorsement of the first three phases of EPAA for its stated mission, that is the defense of our European allies and US forces in the region. It's also relevant that it, uh, the, the same technologies, broadly speaking, which are applicable in the European context are also applicable in the Asia Pacific context and with some variations uh, in the case of the defense of Israel and other friends and allies in the Middle East. Um, the uh, first three phases of EPAA are, they are a package. The, each phase involves an upgrade of a ver various aspects of the systems. Uh, improved missiles, better and more ex extensive sensors, an integration of optical and radar data for discrimination track and engagement, added bases, all adding up to more coverage 
of Europe against the threats as they may evolve. Uh, I won't go into the details, much of which I suspect you know, and if you don't know them, you can read the damn report, which is only 380 pages long, and the unclassified version, and for those of you with clearances, about 7,000 pages long in the classified version. And to, to give you an example of how oversimplified it is, one of our proposals is a new KV for, for uh, homeland defense. And we say it should be designed around a 30 centimeter diameter two color LWIR sensor with additional visible band to detect targets as far away as 3,000 kilometers and this sensor should have a blow down cool 256A, 256 three color focal plane array and so on, I could go on. Um, the point is that it is a serious and technically, I think very sophisticated analysis and, and in my view probably the best unclassified discussion of these issues at least in recent years. And I should hesitate to say that while I wrote that sentence uh, as a lawyer, <laughs> We had, we had real technical people who uh, validate all these conclusions. Um, and the, the sort of bumper sticker conclusion, and we can go into this in more detail if necessary, is that the first three phases will provide as good a defense of Western, of, of all of Europe, uh, as is possible with foreseeable technology, if, it, if the, uh, milestones and the accomplishments are achieved. Now those milestones and accomplishments have not been achieved yet and they are not simple as I am sure Raytheon would agree. But the combination of sensors which will ultimately in phase three uh, support faster interceptors uh, will have a much better integrated command and control which would permit engage on remote should provide an excellent defense and also should address the, uh, as well as can be done, and uh, that is the discrimination problem, essentially because of the improved capabilities of the sensors and the ability to integrate the system so that in particular the engagement radar can deal with the engagement and, and not with other things. There are real uncertainties, uh, whether the four kilometer per second a target will be achieved uh, to some degree. That's related to the question of whether you can do that within the existing vertical launcher system, which if you can't, makes all kinds of other problems. Uh, real testing, um, there's been progress, but there have been, there are, as there always are, there should be in a good testing program. Uh, problems uh, discovered, because you want them to be discovered in the testing program, not when the system has to work. I'm struck by how expensive the testing is. Supposedly this test, which was last October, cost 180, almost $200 million. That's a lot of money for an experiment. Um, the sensor in integration uh, is important. Um, and anyone who tries to tell you that we don't have to worry about discrimination uh, is smoking something. Uh, early intercept which is a sort of half-hearted version of boost phase, only the idea is you do it uh, after, you do, you do it in place you can get close enough to do it, and you hopefully do it before the uh, threat objects have deployed is simply infeasible. The United States has done almost immediate deployment of RVs uh, ages ago. Uh, it's, not, it's not that hard. Um, so the first conclusion is EPAA is very good for uh, European defense, for regional defense. The fourth phase is a much hotter interceptor, and that's going to be hard to do. And even if it was done, it, putting it in Europe is not the optimal place to put it. I refer you to the discussion in the, in the report for the reason and the reason why the alternative system that the committee proposes uh, would be a better system. So I was very heartened by Jim Miller's statement that the administration has a, and the Pentagon has an open mind on phase four, which is a good idea. Always a good idea to have an open mind. Um, it's also important to make the point that the 
the point about defense of NATO Europe, of, of Europe in general, is important to, is subject to a very important qualification, which is countries that are close to the threat are by definition not defended by a system which is primarily for a, a long and medium range threat. For that, you need a shorter range defense system like THAAD. Um, I was amused by how many people in this, even in this room, knew what THAAD stood for before he told us. I was very impressed. Um, you need that, and, and there are other countries besides Turkey for whom it is potentially an issue. The European contribution to the command and control system is important, but we should also shouldn't kid ourselves about what the statement about interim capability means. It, 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 it is the very important first step, but it is only a first step. The politics of this is complicated. Um, Within the alliance, different countries have very different views of the threat. They have very different views of the uh, Russian el element. And I think to some degree, they have very different views of whether missile defense is a good idea or not. Um, the Russians, it's, not, it's totally to me to still totally unclear what the Russians, quote, really think. The possibilities range from extreme paranoia, although I suppose the Russians would also say that given their history, even paranoids have real enemies sometimes, to it's simply a convenient device to buy time till they think there is a politically useful time to reach some kind of a compromise. I worry a little bit that, that the Russians' primary motive is what it has been historically on issues like this, which is this is a good stick to try to create a wrong image. This is a good instrument by which to try to create a wedge between the United States and its European allies or within and among uh, the, the allies. It should be a natural area <coughs> for cooperation. After all, the Lord in his infinite wisdom put Iran a lot closer to uh, Russia than to the United States. Uh, Russia and the United States are, at least at the moment, the only serious players in BMD technology. If what the Russians are really worried about is its potential uh, for uh, a threat to their strategic deterrent, there are a thousand ways, most of which I think have been proposed already and turned down, uh, to convince them that that is true and allow them to verify that. If they want to neuter the system, that's fundamentally unacceptable. There's also a domestic U.S. aspect to this. Uh, everything about missile defense is controversial. It is certainly an article of faith within the Republican Party, or within too much of the Republican Party, that the only thing uh, worse than uh, limits on American missile defense is higher taxes on very, very rich people. Um, and there is potentially an issue about the, the financial feasibility of uh, the United States bearing the bulk of the cost of a defense of Europe. But I think the point that uh, was just made, that the defense of Europe is essential not only for the defense of American forces and not only uh, for the defense of key elements of the system wherever the interceptors are based, uh, but, and, and not only because it is essential to the United States that our allies uh, feel they have a defense, but because for technical reasons, uh, a, the f type of defense that phase three would offer is also an essential element in preventing certain tactics which could be used to defeat a, 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 U a purely US-based system. Uh, so I've, I've run over time too, but thank you very much. Thank you, Walt. I mean, you, you kicked off, I think, the, the, the basis for a pretty good discussion. You talked about EPAA, and we've had, I think, two views here. One of real, and this bleeds in from our morning discussion with Jim Miller, real determination to, quote, unquote, see it through. But then also some views express some, there are some uncertainties and maybe even an advocacy of a need to rethink elements of EPAA. I was struck by how little we talked about Russia a year ago or two years ago I ran in the last out of time. conference. It was a major subject. Maybe frustration has poured in. And then we got a little bit of a taste of some strategic uh, thinking going on in Poland and how it's affecting its, its evolving force structure, particularly the introduction of its own 
air and missile defense system. Let me start off with, by asking Frank th this question. I mean, you got to think of dose a little bit here uh, from, from, from Marston. I certainly got a dose of it when I was in Poland uh, in Central Europe recently. That how committed is, is the United States to seeing EPAA through phase three and phase four? Uh, is there differences in certainty between the two phases? Is the administration committed to one, less to the other? How, how do you respond to those who say, mm -hmm. wow, we are worried that uh, we're not sure phase three yeah. will actually happen? Well, th that's an excellent question, Ian. Let me, let me start by saying the president is fully committed to the European phase adaptive approach. Uh, this was one of his signature national security uh, initiatives that he rolled out in 2009. Uh, you know, I think Jim did a really nice job at discussing the challenges associated with phase four, which is really focused on the SM3 block 2B. So let me focus my remarks on uh, phase three. Um, I think we are in a really good place on phase three. Uh, the agreement with Poland is signed and ratified and in force. Um, the development of the block, uh, SM3 Block 2A interceptor, which we're co-developing with Japan, uh, is going along very nicely. Uh, and thirdly, we are making a great deal of progress with the development of the Aegis Ashore system, which is being built in Moorestown, uh, New Jersey. And I think they're getting very, very close to uh, uh, moving that out to uh, Pacific uh, Missile Test Range. So I think, you know, all the technical elements are in place for phase three. Uh, it seems that all the funding has been provided for, by Congress for phase three. Uh, so we're in a good place. But I, I really want to also pick up a point that uh, Walt raised and Martian raised, and that is the link between the EPAA including the earlier phases. It's not just phase four that contributes to the defense of the United States. People seem to forget about that. Um, phase one with the radar in Turkey, uh, that data from that radar uh, were Iran to develop a long-range missile would provide data to US homeland defense capabilities. Uh, secondly, the phase three capability in Poland, the SM3 Block 2A, would contribute to the defense of the Filingdale's radar, which is critical to the defense of the United States, given our current sensor capability. So um, I think the bottom line is the president is fully committed to the European phase adaptive approach. But more importantly, the European phase adaptive approach is critical to the homeland defense of the United States. Could I, could I just add that the National Academy report regards the achievement of phase three, which includes, it's not the only element, but includes the basing in Poland, as an essential premise of the conclusion that EPAA works for uh, defense of, of Europe. And we agree also with the point about a defense of Europe being critical to the overall the homeland defense architecture working. Our, our questions, our doubts are about the optimality of phase four, not about the importance of phase three. But Walt, in your view, from what I'm hearing is, you, you seem to be saying there's phase three, if, as long as that is locked in, it really doesn't matter if we really fully execute phase four. It doesn't matter for European defense. It, if, we also think there, don't get me started on the problems with the GBI system. Uh, which we're not, th we're not talking about the problems of homeland defense. The, the big recommendation of the report is a, is a very considerable do-over of the homeland defense. But one of the points is that it would be, it, if you, when you do it, it would be better to deploy it in the east coast of the United States with the EPAA and the sensors in place than to put it into um, the European base. Marcin, let me ask you two questions. One, how does this discussion resonate uh, on your side of the Atlantic, uh, particularly perhaps in, in Warsaw? And then also I wanted to give you a chance to kind of uh, talk a little bit about what are some of the, the goals and timelines for Poland's air and missile defense program. It resonates in a kind of ambivalent way. 
Uh, and the reason for that being that, um, you know, the, uh, the plans for the former deal were, were cancelled. Uh, and that people put their um, energies in that deal being made, yeah, in 2008. That's what I mean. So then when we have uh, a, a discussions which are putting question marks even into uh, just uh, phase four, or the location of phase four, you get lots of misinterpretation. And with misinterpretation, you also get, um, which is fueled by suspicion. But, you know, in a context, you also have the microphone incident. Um, I don't know if I need to explain that. Do the I? The and it's clear here. <laughs> OK. Uh, so uh, th th there is a suspicion in Poland that phase three may not happen. Uh, even if uh, uh, the, the, the report of the audit office concerned just report phase four, put some question marks to that, uh, some people and uh, you know in, in a fairly prominent position, th their interpretation was that it was about phase three. Uh, and then you have you know media picking up on that and saying you know this deal will be again cancelled. Uh, so it was really good to have uh, Rose Gottemüller in Poland at the time when, when these discussions were, were taking place. And Brad Roberts, Roberts you know, coming again and saying, you know, this is uh, phase three is, is certain, it will happen, don't worry, it's on schedule and the money is there. Um, so uh, that, that was a really good uh, piece of public diplomacy and, and, and having that you know, more often uh, would be uh, desirable. Um, now, on the issue of, uh, of our own um, uh, you know, missile defense, if you like, uh, this is really about air and missile defense. Uh, the point here is that, that our own air defenses are, are basically redundant at this point. We have to modernize them. As we modernize them, uh, it makes sense to, uh, to uh, have wash and go and to have you know, both missile and uh, air and missile defense system in, in place. Uh, it's very important that it needs to be compatible with uh, a part, it needs to be really a part of the NATO system, and that's, uh, that's the way it, uh, it is going. Let me just follow up on that with Walt and, and, and Frank here. I mean, Poland's undertaking this new initiative, a new capability. How do you see that feeding into NATO requirements? Is it a needed requirement? Is it a gap that has to be filled? Or is this going to be more fighter jets in to, to an alliance that already has an oversupply? And then what is the potential for it uh, for the bilateral relationship? I mean, Bogoslav Vini, the deputy foreign minister, was here and t in the spring and was talking about this program as perhaps potentially as significant as Poland's acquisition of F-16s, which, of course, now is an important pillar in our bilateral relationship. Um, well, the first thing I'm going to say about this is that whatever Poland decides to do, it should not do it because it doesn't think it can trust the United States. I think there is probably no bilateral relationship in Europe which is more important than the, the solid U.S.-Polish relationship. And, and it, it would be unfortunate if this was said to be something which, which you have not said, but other people have, that it, is, it arises because we can't trust the United States. That said, Poland obviously faces uh, and the Russians make all these casual threats, which if we ever made them would drive everybody crazy about putting nuclear weapons in places we promise not to put. Even Every time there's South Korean, some South Korean conservative says the United States should bring nuclear weapons back to the Korean Peninsula, we say it would be a very bad idea and the alliance works just fine without them. Uh, so I think the, it's very easy to understand why Poland regards a close-in defense as critical, which phase three, and let's be honest, phase three won't do that. That's not, not part of the system. Yeah. Defends important parts of Poland, but it doesn't defend them against Russian, uh, Russian missiles in Kaliningrad. Uh, on the other hand, it is a very large amount of money. And I think it is, like every other country, Poland has to decide what, what are the critical components what, what, are the, what are its priorities in terms of defense taking into account not only that it wants to have a confidence in its, its own defense, but that it is a part of an alliance? Um, I mean, my, my sense is that if, if Poland were to make that decision, as it looks like they will, uh, it could be a very important place for U.S.-Polish US cooperation, assuming, of course, 
you buy an American system, which would be a good idea. Uh, Ian, I would just add is, you know, one, this is a decision for, for Poland to take, but I think it's very, very important to note that the alliance, NATO, has shortfalls when it comes to tactical missile defense capabilities. Um, you know, one um, officer once described the missile defense shortfall for uh, tactical systems as uh, chocolate-covered crack cocaine. You just can't get enough of them. Uh, I, I think, you know, if I were to give any advice to, to our, our Polish friends, it's buy a system that's fully integratable with the NATO alt air uh, active layered theater missile defense architecture, because I think that will be key, because it's not just using these capabilities in Europe like we have a situation in Turkey, but it's also having the capability, and this is something that you worked on, Ian, about the NATO response force uh, early in the uh, Bush administration, having key strategic cap capabilities that can deal with the real threats that we face. Uh, one of the key deliverables uh, coming out of uh, the Lisbon summit uh, was kind of this whole, uh, excuse me, the Chicago summit was this whole smart defense initiative and tactical missile defense capabilities like Patriot Pact 3 was a, a key element of those deliverables. Thank you. Let me open it up and uh, ask our, our people who, quite, who have questions or comments to be really brief because we're very tight in our time. Harlan? Just yell. Use your command voice. Question, the question I want to ask, well, I will, is the current dead? You might want to think about that. My real question concerns the one topic that nobody has raised so far, and that's money. Is missile defense really affordable, and what are we going to give up? If you take a look at the Pentagon budget right now, it is so twisted by amounts of money that it cannot afford in terms of personnel, in terms of cost overruns. So where do you put missile defense in all of this? And what are you prepared to give up to keep it? Well, maybe I can answer because I, I don't have a party line. Um, the American defense budget can prudently be reduced. The way, we're, the way we're being forced to do it by the sequester is genuinely the worst possible way. Uh, one of the sensible things that the Republicans in the House have suggested is more flexibility in how that's done on the defense side. And it's equally true that the way we're being forced to reduce domestic spending is equally stupid in areas which, in, and in areas which are genuinely equally as important. So you have to separate the issue of how is it, how do the cuts allocated under sequester from the overall reduction which is required in the defense budget. And Missile defense, although expensive in absolute terms, and it has to be compared to how much you've got for procurement in general, is in fact not all that expensive compared to the overall defense budget. And there's no reason on earth why the United States can't continue to prioritize missile defense over some other things. Yeah, I, I would just add, uh, I would say that over the past 20 years, there's generally been bipartisan support for a general level of missile defense funding, and it's run about $8 billion a year. Um, but I would also say is that missile defenses are an enabler of other forces. You never can get enough, but in a contingency uh, situation, you're going to need your missile defense capabilities in order to secure your ports, secure your airfields in order to have your follow-on uh, forces. So I think it will continue, especially the theater defense uh, capabilities, to be a, a key priority for our combatant commanders. Edgar? I can see the five-minute sign up there, so it's just going to be a brief comment. Uh, I wanted to congratulate uh, Poland on its decision to invest this money in low-level interceptors, which is a wonderful opportunity for European industry to supply its interceptors uh, to meet your needs. Uh, I'm sorry, Raytheon, I had to say that. <laughs> but um, there is a serious point here that um, as we deploy missile defense in Europe, it's, it's going to be a NATO capability commanded and controlled by NATO. And I congratulate the United States on getting that absolutely right in the EPAA. 
if it wasn't like that, the political complications would be, I think, quite serious. But in the same, by the same token, on the industrial side, it's very important that we allow and encourage uh, European industry to play its part in the development of this capability. Okay. Marshall, do you want to comment? Um, really, just very briefly, I mean, that, that naturally the, the issue here is about uh, having the best possible capability to address the, uh, the issue and the threat that we're dealing with. Uh, and it, it is not entirely clear whether there is a technology in Europe to do that. Um, we, we know about the uh, um, MBDA uh, French offer on that, but it's never been tested, really. Really? Uh, okay. Um, and uh, we, there is a great expectation that whatever, uh, whatever purchase will be made in Poland, the Polish defense industry would be involved. Uh, hence, uh, you would have a European component in that, uh, whichever way it goes. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I, I just was surprised that the panel discussion on Europe didn't mention MIA and the fact that, that we're talking about trying to have cooperation and if the U.S. backs out of it. Uh, and it's clearly, uh, with 100 nations having ballistic missiles, it seems relevant to discuss tactical situations. And that was the concept behind a joint MIADS program. And, and yet it doesn't even get mentioned today? Frank? It's been, well, MIADS has been on life support yeah. for a long time. Uh, my, imp and it is, it is addressed at least briefly, although <laughs> largely in the past yeah. tense in the National Academy report, has an excellent radar, which has an ap applicability for some of the future systems. And my understanding is that, that to keep it going, it's been integrated with the PAC-3 program, although there are undoubtedly people in the audience who know more about that in detail than I do. Uh, I mean, my personal view is that MIADS was always a very good idea, and the United States Army didn't like it very much, and uh, therefore it didn't, never went anywhere. Um, that's, that's an aspect of the long story about the problems we have in genuine uh, cooperative developments with uh, with other countries for mostly very bad reasons. I, I'm going to try and close this now with, with a question that kind of ties uh, the European, the transatlantic missile defense architecture more broadly to the kind of the, the global challenges of dealing with the proliferation of ballistic missiles. And I have to ask the panelists, and sort of a kind of closing brief remark, how do you see uh, NATO transatlantic missile defense cooperation relating to the efforts that are going on in the Gulf and that are beginning to emerge in, in, in Asia Pacific. Is this a time for NATO's global partnerships to start reaching out in, on a missile defense plane? Are there things that we ought to be doing now to take the experiences and lessons learned from transatlantic missile defense to these other regions? You know, Ian, I would say a, a couple of things. Uh, one, I think NATO still has a lot of internal work to do on missile defense. Um, you know, we declared interim capability last year, but internal, NATO has a lot of work to do. That said, uh, as Jim Miller mentioned in his speech, there is the nimble titan war game. Uh, that is really the premier NATO missile defense exercise. But more importantly, uh, that exercise consist of a number of other participants around the world. Uh, and I, when I was at the Pentagon back in the uh, previous decade, it was, uh, Nimble Titan was initially a very, very small, I think it was a US, UK event, and it's really morphed into a global exercise. Uh, but I would also argue that that exercise has been critical from an intellectual point of view at, in helping NATO develop its rules of engagement, concept of operation. And there has been a cross-pollinization effect in our integration uh, and involvement of the other nations from around the world, from the Gulf, from uh, the Asia Pacific region. So I think the bottom line at, from technical cooperation, I think NATO still has a lot of work that they need to do internal. But I think the uh, 
intellectual work has already begun, and I think it's manifested in the Nimble Titan War Game. Walt? Uh, more generally, I think the problem of, we, one of the other things we haven't talked about is why missile defense fits into a broader strategic approach. And I think the, the main problem about nuclear weapons in the foreseeable future, now and in the foreseeable future, is not that we need them to deter nuclear attacks, but we need to deal with a way in which people, rogue states, try to use their nuclear weapons to deter us from, us and our allies and friends from doing things. And missile defense is absolutely critical to that, and that's a common proposition in all three regions. The three regions are different. They're different political. They're different strategically. They have different threats. They're very different geographically. Uh, but I think the basic, we, it would be a very good idea to try to, to the degree we can, promote a common strategic understanding of the role of missile defense in all three regions. Yeah. And while I would just add, that's one of the key elements of Nimble Titan. And it really yeah. has Where do we one. get these names? I don't know. <laughs> Marcin, you have a final word. Well, well thank you. Um, I mean, I would say that, uh, yes, NATO has a lot of, um, you know, homework to, uh, to do on missile defense, but I see the argument really uh, being won. Uh, when we had these discussions in 2008 over the uh, uh, long-range, you know, Bush uh, system, uh, there was a great skepticism in Europe about whether, you know, missile defense was desirable at all. And that argument is, is not there anymore. You know, it's, it's generally you know, accepted now in Europe that missile defense is needed, that's a good thing. Uh, and you have nations like you know, Turkey and, and, and Spain, uh, which were former skeptics, you know, now investing in, in it. So uh, of course, you know, much remains to be done, but uh, politically the argument is one, I believe. And that the, the, the need to work you know, more globally for NATO, uh, especially vis-a-vis -vis, uh, um, you know, missile defense architecture in Asia Pacific, I think it will only come absolutely natural. Uh, it will must it must be, become a part of, uh, of NATO's uh, overall posture. Okay. Marcin, Walt, Frank, thank you very much. I uh, appreciate your time and your insights today. <laughs> Break, and then we're going to convene hard in 15 minutes, which will be at half past. Hey Frank, you don't